Welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship, a virtual gathering of believers seeking to better understand the Word of God, with your hosts, Derek and Sharon Gilbert, and Sam T. Doxon. From the beautiful Missouri Ozarks, greetings and welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship Old Testament Bible Study for Sunday, December 16th, 2018. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and I am flabbergasted. Middle of December, where'd that come from? (laughs) Your gast has been flabbered? It's been flabbered. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well, it's uh, amazing how quickly this year has gone. It seems that it was just... It's it's funny how when you get older, time seems to compress. Yeah. And, and yet when we look back at what we've done this year and how quickly the year has gone by, it seems like it was ages ago that we were in Israel and on Sardinia and in Rome, even though it was le- you know, only about six, seven months ago. But it honestly feels like uh, we just got here in, in mm-hmm. Missouri. It seems like we haven't been here all that long. But you and I were counting up, and uh, when you include Side Friday and Five and Tens— right. We've done over a thousand programs just between the two of us with Skywatch TV. Yeah, which is remarkable when you think about it. Mm-hmm. Um, You've done what, 778? I think so. Five and ten? Something like that. Yeah, the daily updates. And then Sci Friday, we have, um, well, gosh. About three years worth. Uh, yeah, yeah. So over a hundred. Uh, we, we missed our hundredth program. Because <laughs> kind of we right don't pay any attention to it. Don't really pay attention. But um, yeah, so between those, and then of course the. Uh, uh, the actual Skywatch TV broadcast program. We just passed our 200th and we kind of missed that missed one that too. too. So uh, yeah, over a thousand programs and we're coming up on four years here at, uh, at the, the Ridgetop bunker here in Missouri. So God has truly blessed us beyond, uh, beyond measure. And we are grateful for you listening that uh, this, this little Bible study, which began before we came out here has uh, been um, of some value to you because mm-hmm. it certainly has blessed us going through the Bible each week in chronological order and reading verse by verse and trying to exegete as best we can with tools that are available to most everybody. There are so many excellent free Bible study tools on the web, which is reclaiming territory the enemy developed for his own purposes, when you think about it. It is, and then the internet is becoming more and more the devil's playground. Yes, and I it think is. that it's going to really start shutting down free speech oh, in yeah. the coming year. I look for 2019 to bring a lot of changes to mm-hmm. social media. Right. But you think about it, social media, Google, Twitter, YouTube, they make those services available for free. Exactly. And so why should we expect them not to? to exercise control. I mean, we might complain, First Amendment. Well, yeah, but it's their playground. They Mm -hmm. get to set the rules in the playground. Yes. So why should we expect any different, especially considering how the enemy has worked through television, media, movies, newspapers for generations? Mm -hmm. It's the same old story. Educational system. Um, Those spirits, the principalities and powers behind so-called progressives, which is actually regressive because it wants to return us to an ancient pagan morality that Mm -hmm. existed before Mount Sinai, Mm -hmm. um, they get into those areas where they they influence culture the most through the media that we consume that shapes public opinion, through the education system that shapes young minds. And uh, social media is just another aspect of that same onslaught, that same uh, overarching strategy by the enemy to change uh, what people, but you know, it's why the subtitle of my first book was Satan's Psyops from Eden to Armageddon. That's what it's all about. Yeah. But if you have not read The Great Inception, uh, listen, that needs to be on your library shelf. Well, thank you. Huh? That and all of your books and, and Mike Heiser's books, Tom Horn's books, of course, I think there there is a, a body of of work that is going together, a body of works that I think is very important. And I would encourage people to get paper copies of these Mm -hmm. books. I read nearly everything electronically, so I get it that that's a handy way to take your library with you, but we won't always have access to the internet. That's a really good point, and that comes back to what you were saying earlier with the shutdown of free speech. There will be a time when not just speech, but just teachings. In fact, we saw a hint of this this past year in California with a a bill that was proposed by an assemblyman, uh, I believe his name is Evan Lowe, uh, to criminalize any sort of uh, conversion therapy teaching <laughs> under under consumer fraud, you know, un- under the the justification that it's fraudulent, it's not proven. But the way the bill was written, it would have criminalized not just uh, actual uh, conversion therapy itself, but any t- any teaching 
that suggested mm-hmm. that someone who's, who has a same-sex attraction mm-hmm. can change. In other words, you're born this way, you're always going to be born this way, and anyone says any different is breaking the law. Well, the book of Deuteronomy, the book of Leviticus, any preacher who, or pastor who preaches on those books, or, or the book of Romans, you know, you could, you could conceivably prosecute bookstores, churches, and pastors. Yes, exactly. And we're going to see that continue. That's going to work. We are. In fact, you and I are recording a little blurb later on today Mm -hmm. that's talking about the things that we expect in 2019. And we're also going to be discussing that on next week's Sci Friday. It will be our final episode for 2018, and Mm -hmm. we're looking forward to 2019. But again, lots of changes coming. So if you are listening to this through your podcatcher or online anywhere, Mm -hmm. I highly recommend downloading it. If this is something, if our fellowship is something that helps you and you want to share it with mm-hmm. others, having hard copies of these, you know, downloading it to your actual pod uh, device, whether it's an iPod or anything else, your phone, um, uh, if you burn it to a disc, the bottom line is that we are going to lose freedom on the cloud. Mm-hmm. So if you're depending upon something that's out there in the ether, yeah. it yeah. may disappear. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. Uh, we need to do that too. I mean, we've got well, the we've got copies, hard copies of everything, but uh, we need to start putting them out on CD. Oh well, that's that. You know, if you're listening to this and you think that that's a good idea, let mm-hmm. us know and we will make it happen. Yeah, it, it would be a data CD or not a data CD, but it would an be MP3 an MP3 CD, right? Because uh, nearly old, everybody's got an MP3 player, right? Right, right. except for our cars. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yours is yours has one. I have an MP3 player and an audio cassette player in mine. Y- yours is really high end. I know uh, it's got everything. So old, mine. I drive an 05 Honda, and it uh, has the CD player in it, but it's got to be the old audio CD format. Uh, you can't well, do mine's an 07, so yeah. ha. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we drive really <laughs> pretty old cars, but they're paid for. And they're that's, paid yeah. for, and that's the thing. Amen so we'll that. drive them till they drop. That's shall yeah. we open? We shall. Father, we thank you for this day and for bringing us together through your word. Lord, we just pray for wisdom to understand your word to the best of our ability, because just overemphasizing or de-emphasizing based on our own preconceptions can lead us into error. And we just pray that you'll keep us from that. We know that we won't see everything perfectly because not all has been revealed. But Lord, as we seek to understand your will and your word, Please, Father, we just ask for wisdom to rightly understand, and uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we concluded the book of Daniel last week, and... um, Finally. Some fascinating stuff in there, and... uh, We're still talking about the book of Daniel. Only this morning, Derek and I were, were, you know, bouncing ideas back and forth that were taking us back to Daniel. Yeah. You know, and it occurred to me there was some stuff in there that I I forgot that... um, well, I guess when we five years from now, when we get back around to Daniel, because <laughs> we will go back around in this. We're, we're not going to say, okay, we've done it. This oh, is absolutely no. finished. We've learned everything we can possibly learn. We will do it again, but, and we'll get much more out of it the second time right. around. But Daniel 7, um, with the, the vision that Daniel has of the beasts, the four beasts coming out of the sea, we talked about the prophetic aspects of it, but we didn't compare it against other ancient cosmology. And uh, as Mike Heiser wrote in The Unseen Realm, uh, there are really references in there to uh, the the Titans. Yes. So, uh, you know, right, and again, we just skipped right over it. We're not going to go back to it now, but uh, just, you know, mark your calendar sometime in uh, 2023. We'll, we'll be getting back around to that. So um, now we move into, as we continue through our chronological, uh, in cr- chronological order, uh, Daniel. In the order in which they were written. Yes. And, and the events that they record. Mm-hmm. Uh, Daniel, of course, was uh, there from the time Nebuchadnezzar sacked Jerusalem, basically, through the uh, fall of Babylon to the Medes and Persians under Cyrus in 539 BC. And uh, so that's roughly where this picks up, although Ezra skips ahead, uh, but he starts with a recapitulation of what took place after Cyrus uh, conquered the Neo Babylonian Empire. Ezra, chapter 1, verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, which would be 539 or 538 BC, that the word of Yahweh by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Okay, stop there. This idea of the Lord Yahweh coming in and stirring up the spirit of the king of Persia. Mm -hmm. You have to ask yourself, what, what happened? Did he get a vision? 
Did you suddenly wake up one day and go, hey, you know what? I think this is going to be a good idea. Yeah. You don't know. It doesn't say. And it could be either one of those things or both. Hey, the I word, think this would be great. The word, it's ruach for spirit, but mm-hmm. it's ur. That is, uh, tr- th- that is the word here for stirred up. And it means to rouse oneself, to awaken, to incite, to, uh, um, aw- well, basically to wake up. It's It's like he just one day went, Oh, you know what? <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's another example of um, how God can use ungodly men yes. to serve his own ends. Yes. And I know there's been a lot of talk over the last few years among Christians about whether or not Donald Trump is a modern-day Cyrus. Or, Even the rabbis in Israel are saying. Yes. They, in fact, they're the ones who put out those little coins that show Trump yes, side by side with and Cyrus. and they've named streets after him. Yes. I mean, this is they, they, there are rabbis over in Israel today that mm-hmm. really look at Trump as being a, another, an echo of Cyrus to lead them towards the, the construction of the Third Temple. Exactly. Because um, that's what Cyrus did. Yes, Yes, he didn't build it himself, but no, he facilitated it. Exactly. In, in fact, didn't they name the train station there that's going to... That's what they named after him. Yeah, the train station for Donald Trump that connects Tel Aviv to mm-hmm. Jerusalem will yes. bring people from Tel Aviv right to the Temple Mount. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you can see that if you go to Israel with us next year. Yeah, we'll tell you more about that at the end of the study. Uh, still some room on those, on those buses. Um, he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Verse 2, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahweh, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of Yahweh, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. That's interesting. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Yeah. There was, this is a guy who believed in a multiple you know, set of gods. He believed that there were lots of them out there and they were territorial. Yeah, which was common belief back, mm-hmm. in, the, back in the day. We, we tend to think of, of Christianity and Judaism, uh, and, and maybe the way Judaism today is practiced is monotheistic. And we've been certainly taught a monotheistic religion. But really, the, the, the correct term, if we understand biblical doctrine correctly, is either Heno, theistic, or m- monolatrous. Mm-hmm. In other words, we recognize that there are other small g gods, but only one supreme god. Exactly. There is a council. Yeah. Which, don't think of it as a pantheon. It's not a pantheon. Because they don't share, you know, powers. Right. God uh, created a council for his own pleasure, and we see it in uh, several places in the Bible. First Kings 22, Job chapters 1 and 2, where he is consulting with the council. And um, we'll one day be part of that council. Exactly. So um, That's a Mike Heiser reference. Ding, ding, ding. ding, ding. <laughs> so again, monotheism is, is not really an accurate term when it comes to describing Christianity, if we understand it properly, uh, henotheistic or monolatrous. So um, technical terminology there, just hey, a little bit of a, you know, theological lesson there today. Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> um so anyway, yeah, but Cyrus was definitely a polytheist. Mm-hmm. And he said, okay, you, you Jews, you're from Judah, your God's in Jerusalem, go, go back and build up his house again, that's fine. Uh, but I'm still the king of the world. Mm. Then, uh, verse 5, then rose up the heads of the father's houses of Judah no, and Benjamin. No, you skipped for 4. Uh, oh, you're right, you're right, right sorry. Uh, let me go back, uh, I'll do verse 3 once again. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of Yahweh, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor, in whatever place he sojourns, be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Now, that's an interesting verse as well. It, first of all, the word survivor, but I assume that it, it refers to anybody who was brought over and mm-hmm. is still alive. But also possibly any anybody who's... Well, still alive, mm-hmm. which makes you wonder what sort of oppression they were going through in the previous administrations. Yeah, yeah. But, but let's let's and just what, set what, that what, aside. This reminds me of Exodus. It is sort when of they another left, exodus. they were so feared that all they had to do is go up and knock on the door. Here, take this money. Take all this gold. Just get out. Right, right. Yeah, and and that. Uh, 
But these are free will. Yeah. Um, and, and it makes you, again, it makes you wonder what Cyrus experienced to have him say, hey, look, uh, the people who live in this place, help these people out by giving them some silver and, and some camels and stuff that yes. they can use to you know, go back to Jerusalem. Uh, verse 5, then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of Yahweh that is in Jerusalem. And all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares, besides all that was freely offered. Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of Yahweh that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. Interesting, the uh, vessels that... Belshazzar, son of the last king Nabonidus, brought out yes. for his drunken feast for the Akitu festival for the moon god seen. The day of the handwriting on the wall. Yeah. Cyrus, king of Persia, brought these out in the charge of Mithridath, the treasurer. Is that a reference to Mithras? You know, I, the, I don't know. Let me look at the original word here. Yeah. Again, in the ancient world, um, Given by Mithra. Ah, okay. Yes. All right. That would be the uh, theophoric element or the god name or deity name in uh, the name Mithra, Mithridath. Mithridath, the treasurer who counted them out to Shesh, Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. And you thought you were going to not get it, get free without having to pronounce these names. Yeah, uh-huh. just keep laughing. Just look yeah, at the list in chapter two. I know. Uh I know. <laughs> uh, Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. And this was the number of them, 30 basins of gold, 1,000 basins of silver, 29 censers, 30 bowls of gold, 410 bowls of silver, and 1,000 other vessels. All the vessels of gold and of silver were 5,400. All these did Sheshbazar bring up when the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem. Wow. Chapter 2. Now these were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried captive to Babylonia. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. Interesting that we've got this list. Mm -hmm. If you need to check your genealogy, the, the fact that this list of names is given is pretty important. Yeah. Verse 2. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Reeliah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispar, Bigvai, Rehum, and Baana. The number of the men of the people of Israel, the sons of Perosh, 2,172. Who counted all these? That's a really good question. The sons of Shephatiah, 372. The sons of Arah. 775, I hear Sam coming in. Well, you keep reading. I will go attend to Sam. Yeah, you're leaving me alone to read through this list. Verse 6, the sons of Pahath Moab, namely the sons of Yeshua and Yoab, 2,812. He doesn't want to go? No. The sons of Elam, 1,254. The sons of Satu, 945, the sons of Zakai, 760, the sons of Bani, 642, the sons of Babai, 623, the sons of Azgad, 1,222, the sons of Arunikam, 666, (laughs) the sons of Bigvai, didn't we have Bigvai before? Mm. He was one of the leaders, yes. Yeah, 2,056. The sons of Adin, 454. The sons of Ater, namely of Hezekiah, 98. The sons of Pitsai, 323. The sons of Yorah, 112. The sons of Hashum, 223. The sons of Gibar, 995. The sons of Bethlehem, 123. The men of Netophah, 56. The men of Anathoth, 128. That was the city that uh, Jeremiah was from. The Is town. it named after Thoth the god? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Interesting. I'll or let you look or that it might up. be the, 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 Sir, the Canaanite war goddess Anat. Oh, well, yes. It could be that and both. The sons of Atzmavath. 42. Yes. The sons of Kiriatharim, Kefirah, and Be'eroth, 
743. So it is? It, it is the Canaanite war goddess, Anat. Yeah. Ah. The sons of Ramah and Geva, 621. The men of Michmas, 122. The men of Bethel and Ai, 223. Isn't Ai an Egyptian word? Mm, Ay was the name of one of the one of the uh, oh. pharaohs of the 18th dynasty, but I was a very old city with, near Jericho. It was the second city that was conquered in the. It's just in interesting Canaan. that so these names have a lot of pagan god references within them. Yeah, Bethel, House of El, mm-hmm. but uh, it was in that same area north of uh, Jerusalem that um, that I was located in. Yes. Yeah. Verse twenty nine: the sons of Nebo, fifty two as in Nabonidus, Nebo. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the name Mount Morde- Nebo. <laughs> in fact, the name Mordecai, one of the leaders, means worshiper of Marduk. Mm-hmm. So. Verse 30, the sons of Magvish, 156. The sons of the other Elam. There's proper Elam and other, other Elam. Elam. Yeah. 1,254. <laughs> the sons of Harim, 320. The sons of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 725. And it's not Yoko, by the way. Verse 34, the sons of Jericho, 345. This seems to be references to the cities that they came from. Yes. The sons of Sinai, 3,630. The priests, the sons of Jediah, of the house of... Uh, uh, I've been pronouncing these J's as Y's. So, Yediah, mm-hmm. of the house of Yeshua, mm-hmm. 973. The sons of Imer, 1,052. The sons of Pashur, 1,247. The fact that these numbers are so specific Mm -hmm. had to have... This speaks for historicity. Yes. The son... Verse 39. The sons of Harim, 1,017. Verse 40. The Levites, the sons of Yeshua and Kadmiel, of the sons of Hodaviah, 74. The singers, the sons of Avisaf, 128. The sons of the gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Ater, the sons of Talmon, the sons of Akuv, the sons of Hatita, and the sons of Shobai, in all, 139. The temple servants, the sons of Siha, the sons of Hashupa, the sons of Tabaot, the sons of Keros, the sons of Siaha, the sons of Padon, the sons of Levona, the sons of Hagabah, the sons of Akuv, the sons of Hagav, the sons of Shamlai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Gidel, the sons of Gahar, the sons of Rei, the sons of Retzin, the sons of Nekodah, the sons of Katsam, the sons of Utza, the sons of Pasea, the sons of Bitsai, the sons of Ashnai, the sons of Meonuim, the sons of Nephisim, the sons of Magbuk, the sons of Hakufa, the sons of Hatur, the sons of Batsluth, the sons of Mehida, the sons of Harsha, the sons of Barkos, the sons of Zizera. Zizera? Hmm. Sons of Zizera. Interesting. Isn't he the one that had the tent peg driven through his head? He he was. Uh, probably one of the Chardin or Sardinians. Mm-hmm. Verse 53 yeah. again, the sons of Barkos, the sons of Zizera, the sons of Tema, the sons of Nitziai, the sons of Hatifa, verse 55, the sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Sotai, the sons of Hasafereth, the sons of Peruda, the sons of Jaala, the sons of Darkon, the sons of Gidel, the sons of Shephatiah, the sons of Hatil, the sons of Pokereth Hatibaim, and the sons of Amin. All the temple servants and the sons of Solomon's servants were 392. The following were those who came up from Tel Mela, Tel Harsha, Shkeruv, Adan, and Imer, though they could not prove their father's houses or their descent, whether they belonged to Israel. Hmm. Poor guys, lost our papers. Undocumented. (laughs) The sons of, can't do a DNA test. The sons of Deliah, the sons of Tobiah, and the sons of Nekodah, 652. Also of the sons of the priests, the sons of Habiah, the sons of Hakoz, and the sons of Barzillai, who had taken a wife from the daughters of Barzillai of the Gileadite, and was called by their name. 
Remember that they would bring sojourners in. Mm -hmm. And if the sojourner wanted to become a Jew, he was brought into the fold. Right. Verse 62. They sought their registration. (laughs) I need some papers. Among those enrolled in the genealogies, but they were not found there, and so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. This this speaks to why these lists are so important. Mm -hmm. Verse 63. The governor told them that they were not to partake of the most holy food until there should be a priest to consult the Urim and the Thummim. Ah, interesting. Are they really a part of the tribe? What do you think? Yeah, I didn't realize that was still being used as late as the, uh, what was this, would have been the 5th century B.C. Yeah, well, 6th, 538. Well, 6th, that's right. Yeah, this was the first group, 538, right. Verse 64, the whole assembly together was 42,360. Besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337, and they had 200 male and female singers. Their horses were 736. Their mules were 245. Their camels were 435. And their donkeys were 620. Some of the heads of families, when they came to the house of Yahweh, that is in Jerusalem, made free will offerings for the house of God to erect it on its site. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury the work of the work, 61,000 dariks of gold. What's a darik? A quarter of an ounce. 5,000 minas of silver and 100 priests' garments. Now the priests, the Levites, some of the people, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants lived in their towns, and all the rest of Israel in their towns. So 15,000 ounces of gold, roughly, at what is the current rate of uh, gold right now? And about, don't know. What's a mina? I didn't, uh, didn't look uh, up the mina. One and a quarter pounds. Oh, really? Yeah. Spot price of gold as of this recording today is about twelve one thousand two hundred and forty dollars per ounce. So close to seven thousand, about sixty five hundred of uh, silver. So in today's money, uh, what they brought in terms of gold alone would be worth about eighteen point six million dollars. Woo! Plus they brought those animals. Donkeys were very valuable. Well, in fact, in yeah. parts they were sacrificed. <laughs> Well, Amorites concluded treaties by sacrificing donkeys. Yeah. When a building was constructed, they would sacrifice a donkey underneath the the, uh, the foundation. Sometime. Hey, tell you what, let's sacrifice a donkey over it. <laughs> yeah, that's that was that's the, how they put it. Right. Uh, they also sacrificed children occasionally underneath the you know walls of a new building, underneath the foundation of a new building. But, you know uh, what? That is true. But the sad truth is that that will be erased from the internet eventually. Yeah. Because, you know, the pagans are going to be made to look really good. Well, they already are. I mean, you see this in archaeology and sociology now, history now. You don't see much of an emphasis on that. Well, who are we to judge? Yeah, that they, yeah. Well, they were ignorant. They thought it would work. And right. we can't really, you know, you have to. Who are we to say that was evil? Yeah, okay. okay. Imagine you're the ch- your, your newborn child is the one who gets to go under the uh, wall of the new building. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Phoenicians, you don't, you, you hear a lot about the Phoenician culture and civilization. And yes, there's no question that they did amazing things. Uh, Carthage, which was a Phoenician colony from Tyre, almost took down the Roman Empire. But it doesn't change the fact that there were something like 25, 26,000 infants found buried, burned, sacrificed, and buried in urns at the Tophet in Carthage mm-hmm. yes. and, and other Carthaginian sites yes. around the Mediterranean. There were others. Uh, we saw the Tophet at... Uh, at Sardinia. Yeah, at uh, Tarsa, uh, Taros. Yes. So, um, yeah, uh, it, 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 that, that has been whitewashed from history. Mm-hmm. In fact, archaeologists have had a really big argument over the Tophet in uh, Carthage as to whether or not it was actually for sacrificing children. No, these were just babies that were stillborn. Well, that's what we were told by the guide in Sardinia. Yep. These were probably miscarriages, and so they just brought them here to, you know, okay. It's hard to see why a a god would accept a child born dead as a sacrifice of any worth. No. No, No. you would simply, well, frankly, if you thought it was nothing more than tissue, okay, Mm -hmm. this is not really a life, so I'll just chuck this into the bin. Right. 
right? Anyway, uh, th- but that's that's what goes on inside um, mm-hmm. uh, academic circles these days is that they are trying to uh, you know kind of whitewash that history. And isn't it funny that among so called progressive academia and progressive society, they're more afraid of Christians talking the way we're talking than of the pagans who would um, literally slaughter their own children or other religions that are very prominent today who um, would gladly push over a wall on top of the lifestyle, people living the lifestyle that many of these so-called mm-hmm. progressives are living. Yes, yeah. So anyway, it's we, it's another story. It's going to be a crazy day. world. 2019 is going yep. to be that and much more. Yep. Well, uh, Ezra chapter 3. When the seventh month came and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. The seventh month would have been late September, early October. So were they going there for Rosh Hashanah? Well, it makes you wonder. Or for Rosh Hashanah. Tents. Let's see. Uh, I, I, I keep getting confused. The, this is first the seventh month of, of Nisan, the year. Right. First of Nisan. Uh, this would have been the month of Tishri, which would have been the... Uh, well, this would have been the anniversary, really, of when uh, Babylon fell, because it was in the month of uh, Tishri. Oh. Um, the 16th or 17th of Tishri, when, when Babylon fell. Uh, this would have been the Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles begins on the 15th of Tishri. Mm-hmm. Um, Rosh Hashanah. Is that is that in Tishri, or is that in Nisan? Nisan is the month, is the spring new year. One of them is a should know this. Uh, one of them is a, a uh, like a civil calendar New Year, and the other is a religious calendar New Year. I think the New Year, the 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 one in the fall is the the religious. I think because that's supposed to, cor- uh, to commemorate the day that Adam was born. Okay, looking it up now. Rosh Hashanah is uh, yes, it is in Tishri. So uh, this year, in fact, it was in September. Began on September ninth. So uh, yes, so this would have been the New Year, Rosh Hashanah. Uh, when the seventh month came, and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. And they got there because they were going to Jerusalem, getting there in time for Sukkot, the Feast of mm-hmm. Tabernacles, which was the big festival. Which was the tents. <laughs> yes. Ah, okay, tents. I was thinking T-E-N-S-E. Yeah, no, I guess T-E-N-T-S. I guess they were tents. <laughs> <laughs> we're pretty tents Moving and we on. don't get there with the tent. Yeah, all these people, and you got to move 6,000 donkeys. It probably took a while to, to make that journey. Uh, yes, no question. And they no doubt went through all sorts of... Think about that. We've been through that land. Mm-hmm. That's not an easy travel. No. Um, there were established caravan routes. They would likely have traveled up the Euphrates to around the ancient city of Mari, which is around where the Syria-Iraq uh, border is today. Mm-hmm. And then from there, a, a caravan trail branched off and headed west through what uh, was called Tadmor back in the day, but it's uh, Palmyra now. Mm-hmm. Went through Palmyra through Damascus and probably came in from the north. There's a road there today. Yeah. The road that goes from Tel Aviv over towards Syria. From Tel Aviv to Syria. Well, not directly to Syria, but I mean it runs along the north part of Israel. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, up past Mount probably Vermont. following Exactly. Probably following an old caravan route. And, and comes down yeah, either through the Bekaa Valley, which is in between... Mount Hermon, the anti-Lebanon mountains, and the Lebanon mountains, and mm-hmm. then through past Dan, um, or the other side. Dan's gift mountain, shop. Yeah, or the other side and comes through the Golan Heights. <laughs> but anyway, they would have come that way. Instead of coming straight west from Babylon, you wouldn't do that because you cross the desert and you die. No, and, and uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because as a kid, when I would hear this stuff, you know, okay, they came back from Babylon, they went to, you know, and they started building the, the thing in Jerusalem. I always pictured them going straight to, to Jerusalem, but yeah. they didn't. Mm-hmm. No, they went through a lot of other stuff to get there, which meant... Um, all along the way, you've got to negotiate. We need water. We need food. We need, uh, you know, food for feed for our animals. Um, yeah, there, there would have been. They would have had to pack a lot of their own stuff. But mm-hmm. the water, you can only carry so much. It's heavy, and uh, so along the way, you have to stop at oases and uh, negotiate with the traders there. It, yeah, it would have been a long and rather difficult journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, not the kind of thing you would do in a few days. We're talking, you know, weeks, months, yeah, probably. probably a probably a couple of months at least. When the seventh month came and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Then arose Yeshua, the son of Yozadak, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Shealtiel, with his kinsmen. And they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the peoples of the lands. And they offered burnt offerings on it to Yahweh they, because, yeah, they knew that the uh, 
neighbors. Then, as today, we're not really happy about setting up anything on the Temple Mount. Right. We had this, this fight and over the, the Temple Mount. And the altar was just dedicated in Jerusalem. Yeah, the Sanhedrin, mm-hmm. the reconstituted Sanhedrin just did that this past Monday, December 10th, mm-hmm. the final day of Hanukkah this year. Um, let's see. Uh, and uh, verse four, and they kept the Feast of Booths. Okay, well, as we were there you go. right on. The Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot, as it is written, and offered the daily... No, I, I skipped a verse. Go back to three. Yep. Yeah. They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the peoples of the lands, and they offered burnt offerings on it to Yahweh, burnt offerings morning and evening. And they kept the Feast of Booths as it is written. They were right, Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. As it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number, according to the rule, as each day required. When Moses got the law, on day one of the Feast of Tabernacles, they sacrificed and burned 13 bulls. And then day two was 12. Day three was 11. Day four was, you get through the seven Adding days. Adding it up to. 70. Exactly. Representing the 70 gods of the nations, the 70 sons of El, B'nai Elohim on Mount mm-hmm. Hermon. In other words, the gods of all the other nations. This was God's, Yahweh's, Sign to the people of his promise to deliver them from the gods of all the other nations. Punch in the face. Exactly. In in the spirit realm. In in love. <laughs> uh, verse 5. And after that, the regular burnt offerings, the offerings at the new moon, and at all the appointed feasts of Yahweh, and the offerings of everyone who made a free will offering to Yahweh. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to Yahweh. But the foundation of the temple of Yahweh was not yet laid. So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food, drink, and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa, uh, that's uh, Jaffa today, Mm -hmm. according to the grant that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, in the second year after their coming to the house... You have to love that. Do you have a legal, you know, right to be in that land? Are you scratching yourself? Uh, Well, I didn't. I I must have. I don't know what what was there that uh, (laughs) I scratched open. Like, (laughs) what the heck? I'm bleeding. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, it's a dangerous job. We, and interesting, we too, it. that we've got, you know, the Sidonians and the Tyrians coming down once again, just like with Solomon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, well, that's the, no, the... We're the guys that know how to do it. And the only real good source of timber in the in the Levant. Exactly. Not a whole lot of tree. No. No. Not uh-uh. much. Uh, olive, Especially at you, that time. You don't want to build with olive wood. There, for one thing, those trees aren't big enough to get boards out of. Um. Where were we? At, verse, eight. Uh, verse 8. Now in the second year, after their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Yeshua, the son of Yozadak, made a beginning together with the rest of their kinsmen, the priests and the Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to supervise the work of the house of Yahweh. And Yeshua, with his sons and his brothers, and Kadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, Judah, <laughs> Yehuda, together supervised the workmen in the house of God, along with the sons of Henadad and the Levites, their sons and brothers. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of Yahweh, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and they did that at the ceremony last Monday, too. Yes. The guys with silver trumpets. I know, I know. Yeah. And the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise Yahweh, according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to Yahweh, For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever and ever. Been in churches toward Israel. Been a responsorial psalm. Yes, Mm -hmm. for endures forever toward Israel. New glasses. (laughs) And you're bleeding. (laughs) And I'm bleeding. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised Yahweh, because the foundation of the house of Yahweh was laid. So this would be 538 BC when this was this was Mm -hmm. laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. It makes you wonder why they're weeping. Is it because this, this house is so much poorer than when Solomon built, or because they thought they'd never live to see it? Boy, I mean, that, that, that's hard. But when you are so, you remember all the things that you left behind and the fact that you finally get to achieve something you've longed for. Yeah. I mean, think about the, the, the Jews from other nations who make Aliyah and they go mm-hmm. back to Israel. They often weep when they arrive. Sure. And they kiss the ground. Sure. And, and I can relate to that, even just a little bit, you know, just uh, 
the emotion of seeing the things that we saw in, in Israel in May. And um, you know, to the best of my knowledge, all of my ancestors descend from Japheth. So mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't have that same blood connection to the land except for the grafting in, you know, the ingrafting that takes place as one who's accepted mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. But uh, still, seeing the place and knowing that there was where David defeated the son of Rapha, Goliath, there was where the, 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 the watchers came down to Mount Hermon and tried to kill us all. Mm-hmm. There was where Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? That is, that is very emotional. But then to Standing on the Mount of Olives. Yes, and looking down on the Temple Mount and seeing that gate there, the one that's closed, that's the one that's going to open when he comes back. Uh-huh. It's Yeah, that was all very, very powerful. But imagine being an old man or an old woman who remembered seeing the Temple of Solomon as a child. And witnessing the destruction of that temple by Nebuchadnezzar's mm-hmm. army in 589. Mm-hmm. And now here you are more than 60 years later. And so you've got to be in your 70s or 80s and thinking, I was never going to see this again. And here we are. We are rebuilding it. Yeah, maybe, maybe it was weeping for joy. That's what I think, too. Yeah, yeah. How are we doing in time? It's, uh, we're about 42 minutes in. Oh, so. got time. Yeah. Ezra chapter 4. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjam- Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to Yahweh, the God of Israel. They approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do. And we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Israel, who brought us here. King of Assyria. But Zerubbabel, Yeshua, and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses in Israel said to them, You have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God, but we alone will build to Yahweh, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build Mm -hmm. and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose— all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. I would say that if I were a third millennium believing Jew, Mm -hmm. I would look at these two verses and I would see that as occurring right now. Oh, sure. The people of the land, Mm -hmm. the people of Judah, make them afraid to build. Yes. And they bribe counselors against them to Mm -hmm. frustrate their purpose. There are a lot of... um liberal Jews who think that uh, Israel should just give up the Temple Mount. Hey, it's not worth fighting for. What yeah. are, you know, what do we care? But it's Be- more than that. It's more than just secular or liberal Jews. It's mm-hmm. also the people who claim that's their land. Right, right. And the people in the rest of the world that support those folks. Yeah, yeah. No, what goes... A, the, yeah, this is almost <laughs> like a, a pattern for, All of this has happened before, and it, it will, will happen all, again. All of it will happen again. It, well, the day is coming when that's stopping. The Lord is saying, enough of this. Yeah, the pattern ends The now. already but not yet is coming to an end. <laughs> this is the omega point. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and not in a uh, cosmist sort of way. Right. Verse 6, and in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. Now, this is Xerxes or Artaxerxes? Uh, this is Xerxes. Yeah, Ahasuerus was, was his Persian name, but we know him mainly by his Greek name, Xerxes. This always reminds me of Other Derek. Yeah, <laughs> he yeah, claimed, yeah. I, if you've ever heard me tell the story of Other Derek, it's this spirit that was hounding me for years. You know, you can, as a believer, be you know, hounded by mm-hmm. a spirit. And this thing was appearing to me in the form of Derek, sometimes who Derek was in the room. Hmm. And I asked it early on, what is your name? And he said, Ahasuerus. Yeah, Xerxes. Yes, hmm. it's a pretty bold thing to claim. Yes. Liar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Verse 7, In the days of Artaxerxes, Bishlam, and Midrath, Mithradath, and Tabel, and the rest of their associates, wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Now, just for time stamping here, Artaxerxes reigned from 464 to 424 BC. So we have moved ahead from 538 BC to 464 BC. Yes. We've moved ahead almost 65 years. At the very least, we've got a paragraph change. Yes. I'd say chapter change. Yeah. In the days of Artaxerxes, 
I'm going to read it again, Bishlam and Mithradat, and Tebel and the rest of their associates wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Dear Artie, <laughs> we don't like them. This letter was written Aramaic and translated. Rehom, Rehom the commander and, Sh- and Shemeshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, the king, as follows. Hmm. Dear Artie, Rehum the commander, Shishai the scribe, and the rest of their associates, the judges, the governors, the officials, the Persians, men of Erek. The men of Erek, that's Uruk, that's mm-hmm. Iraq. Yes. Hmm. The Babylonians, the men of Susa, that is the Elamites. That's Western Iran. And the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Osnapar deported. Who's Osnapar? Um... And settled in the lands of oh, Samaria. Oh, oh. Uh, the, the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal. Oh. In the 7th century BC. First yeah, in, in again. In, and the in rest, Aramaic, it's yeah, Osnipar yes, in again. Aramaic. And the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Osnipar deported and settled in the cities of Samaria and in the rest of the province beyond the river. Uh, Aramaic at the time was, as you've said, the lingua franca of the time, wasn't it? It was, yeah. So that's the, why parts of Daniel are written Aramaic. Right. The Assyrians made Aramaic the official diplomatic language, replacing Akkadian, exactly. which was a very, very old language. 19th century, this was written in French. Yeah. Um, and the land beyond the river, by the way, is a uh, the name the Persians gave the province west of the Euphrates River. So basically everything in Syria, west of the Euphrates, Jordan, Israel, Lebanon today. Verse 11. This is a copy of the letter that they sent. To Artaxerxes the king... Your servants, the men of the province beyond the river, send greetings. And now be it known to the king that the Jews who came up from you to us have gone to Jerusalem. They are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are finishing the walls and repairing the foundations. Now be it known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and the walls finished... They will not pay tribute, custom, or toll, and the revenue, the royal revenue will be impaired. Hmm. Now, because we eat the salt of the palace, and it is not fitting for us to witness the king's dishonor, therefore we send and inform the king in order that... This is really Weasley language. Yeah. We send and inform the king in order that search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers. You will find in the book of the records and learn that this city is a re- rebellious city, hurtful to kings and provinces, and that sedition was stirred up in it from old. That was why the city was laid waste. We made known to the king that if this city is we make known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls finished, you will have no possession in the ro- in the province beyond the river. Hmm. The king sent an answer. To Rehom, the commander in Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their associates who live in Samaria, and the rest of the province beyond the river, greeting. And now the letter that you sent to us has been plainly read before me. And I make a decree, and search has been made, and it has been found that this city from of old has risen up against kings, and that rebellion and sedition had been made in it. And mighty kings have been over to Jerusalem who ruled over the whole province beyond the river to whom tribute, custom, and toll were paid. Therefore, make a decree that these men be made to cease and that this city be not rebuilt until a decree is made by me and take care not to be slack in this matter. Why should damage grow to the hurt of the king? And when the copy of King Artaxerxes', Artaxerxes letter was read before Rahum and Shimshai the scribe and their associates, they went in haste to the Jews at Jerusalem and by force and power made them cease. Then the work on the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped, and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Hmm. Ezra chapter 5. Now the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. And we will get to the books of Haggai and Zechariah in the weeks ahead. So much good stuff coming up. 
Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Yeshua, the son of Yozadak, arose and began to rebuild the house of God that is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. At the same time, Tetanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Sheter Bozanai and their associates came to them and spoke to them thus, Who gave you a decree to build this house and to finish this structure? They also asked him this, What are the names of the men who are building this building? We'd like to take them to the prosecutor there in the, in Washington, D.C. Yeah. And it, we, we want to bring them in. We're going to issue some warrants for their arrest. Subpoenas, and uh, we'll get to and charge them with perjury. And um, But the eye of their God was on the elders of, Jeru- of the Jews, and they did not stop them until the report should reach Darius, and then an answer be returned by letter concerning it. It's like, well, look, we got a temporary restraining order, mm-hmm. so until we hear back from the king, we're going to keep building. Yep. This is a copy of the letter that Tataniah, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Shethar Bozanai and his associates, the governors who were in the province beyond the river, sent to Darius the king. They sent him a report. Now, Darius, this was the successor to Xerxes. Mm -hmm. Daniel is still alive. um, Didn't he live during the reign of Darius? This would be a a second Darius. Oh, okay. Wrong one. No, wait a second. Wait a second. No, you're right. You're right. We uh, we're, we're we've kind of skipped back in history here. A little bit. <laughs> a bit. Um, the second year of Darius' reign would be 520 BC. So yes, Daniel would still be around as an old man. So essentially, at this time. what we're seeing is this story is being told from another angle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we we skipped backwards here. Flash sideways. Uh, this is a copy of the letter that Tataniah, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Shethar Bozanai and his associates, the governors who were in the province beyond the river, sent to Darius the king. They sent him a report in which was written as follows. To Darius the king, all peace. Be it known to the king that we went to the province of Judah, to the house of the great God. It is being built with huge stones and timber is laid in the walls. This work goes on diligently and prospers in their hands. Then we asked those elders and spoke to them thus. Who gave you a decree to build this house and to finish this structure? We also asked them their names for your information, that we might write down the names of their leaders. And this was their reply to us. We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth, and we are rebuilding the house that was built many years ago, which a great king of Israel built and finished. But because our fathers had angered the God of heaven, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this house and carried away the people to Babylonia. However, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, Cyrus the king made a decree that this house of God should be rebuilt. And the gold and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple that was in Jerusalem and brought into the temple of Babylon, these Cyrus the king took out of the temple of Babylon, and they were delivered to one whose name was Sheshbazar, Sheshbazar, whom he had made governor. And he said to him, Take these vessels, go and put them in the temple that is in Jerusalem, and let the house of God be rebuilt on its site. Then this Sheshbazar came and laid the foundations of the house of God that is in Jerusalem, and from that time until now it has been in building, and it is not yet finished. Therefore, if it seems good to the king, let search be made in the royal archives there in Babylon to see whether a decree was issued by Cyrus the king for the rebuilding of this house of God in Jerusalem, and let the king send us his pleasure in this matter. Do we have time to get closure on this? Uh, We do. Verse six, uh, chapter 6, Then Darius the king made a decree, and search was made in Babylonia, in the house of the archives, where the documents were stored. And, Ik, and in Ekbatana, the citadel that is in the province of Medea, a scroll was found on which this was written. A record. In the first year of Cyrus the king, Cyrus the king issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt the place where sacrifices were offered, and let its foundations be retained. Its height shall be 60 cubits, and its breadth 60 cubits. With three layers of great stones and one layer of timber, let the cost be paid from the royal treasury. Mm -hmm. No separation of church and state back in those days. (laughs) And also let the gold and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple that is in Jerusalem and brought to Babylon, be restored and brought back to the temple that is in Jerusalem, each to its place. You shall put them in the house of God. Now therefore, Tatanai, governor of the province beyond the river, Shatar, Botsanai, and your associates, the governors who are in the province beyond the river, keep... Away, but the work <laughs> on this house of God 
alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the house of the Jew, the elders of the Jews rebuild this house of God on its site. Moreover, I make a decree regarding what you shall do for these elders of the Jews or the rebuilding of this house of God. The cost is to be paid to these men in full and without delay from the royal revenue, the tribute of the province from beyond the river. Mm -hmm. You guys collect the money from the locals and then you pay them. Exactly. Oops. This didn't work out the way uh, Tataniah had hoped. No. And whatever is needed, bulls, rams, or sheep for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, or oil, as the priests of Jerusalem require, let that be given to them day by day without fail, mm -hmm. that they may offer pleasing sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. He saw some benefit yeah. in this. Mm -hmm. Also, I make a decree that if anyone alters this edict, a beam shall be pulled out of his house, and he shall be impaled on it, <laughs> and his house shall be made a dunghill. Yeah. May the God who has caused his name to dwell there overthrow any king or people who shall put out a hand to alter this, or to destroy this house of God that is in Jerusalem. That is interesting. That is really interesting. This essentially is a curse against anyone who sacks Jerusalem. Hmm, yeah. May the God who has caused his name to dwell there overthrow any king or people who shall put out a hand to alter this. This refers later to the Romans. Yeah. Or to destroy this house of God that is in Jerusalem. I, Darius, make a decree. Let it be done with all diligence. Hmm. That's an interesting verse. Never noticed that before. Neither it has that always been in there. <laughs> has <laughs> Mandela of, been playing with yeah, this that's again? Another one of those, because certainly the Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire, fifth century A.D., overrun by mm -hmm. Germans, basically, and then uh, a thousand years later. Uh, Islam took out the the rest of uh, the remnant of the Eastern Roman Empire. Yes, and of course that gets into the stuff that you've been writing and researching. Mm -hmm. And and I think you make a good case that it's not going to go the way the Islam thinks. No, no. Verse thirteen. Then, according to the word sent by Darius the king, Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, Shatag, Butzanai, and their associates did all with diligence. Did all diligence, did, did with all diligence, I'll come in again, what Darius the king had ordered. And the elders of the Jews built and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Ze Zechariah the son of Edo. They finished their building by decree of the God of Israel and by decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes king of Persia. And this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. This would be February or March in the year 516 B.C. Nearly 70 years to the day from the, when they were yeah, taken out. That's right, because Nebuchadnezzar sacked Jerusalem in 589 or 588, so this mm -hmm. would have been, yeah, 70 years. But 70, 72. Or 72, but numerically speaking, the same point. I'm just thinking, where is Jonathan gone? <laughs> he does math really well and he said he does i got too many other things i live in the 19th century they didn't know math verse 16 and the people of israel the priests and the levites and the rest of the returned exiles celebrated the dedication of this house of god with joy they offered at the ded dedication of this house of god one this will be done again mm -hmm. when, when whether it's a tabernacle that is constructed and the altar put within it Something is going to happen in the very near future in Jerusalem that allows sacrifices to begin. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the people of Israel, the priests and the Levites and the rest of the returned exiles, celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. They offered at the dedication of this house of God 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, hmm. according to the number of the tribes of Israel. And they set the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their divisions for the service of God at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. On the 
fifteenth day of the first month. The returned exiles kept the Passover. Yeah. That had to have been so meaningful. Sure. Uh, that was so many important dates connected that, obviously, the Passover in Egypt, but also the Passover was celebrated just before the conquest of uh, Jericho. Mm-hmm. Verse 19 again, on the 14th day of the first month, the returned exiles kept the Passover. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves together. All of them were clean. So they slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the returned exiles. Okay. I think you're seeing what I was just about to talk Mm -hmm. about. Go ahead. Uh, Well, Rabbi Zev Parat, the Messianic rabbi who will be with us in Israel, told me that the Sanhedrin this past week when they consecrated the stone altar, put out a call to Jews, not just priests, but all Jews, to sacrifice a lamb this coming Passover. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But he said that, in his mind, is a clue that the rabbis are sensing that good works and prayer are no longer enough to redeem from sin. And that's a stepping stone to understanding that all of that has been fulfilled in Messiah. He's already come. And we, as Christians, have an opportunity to say, hey, we know the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen to that. So, yeah. So verse 19 again, on the 14th day of the first month, the returned exiles kept the Passover. Hmm. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves together. By the way, you need a red heifer to do that. Mm-hmm. All of them were clean. So they slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the returned exiles, for their fellow priests and for themselves. It was eaten by the people of Israel who returned from exile and also by everyone who had joined them and separated himself from the uncleanness of the peoples of the land to worship Yahweh, the God of Israel. And they kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with joy, for Yahweh had made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them, so that he aided them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. Hmm. Wow. Uh, Psalm 137 is on the schedule today, and I know we're at an hour already, but it's a relatively short psalm. But because it relates to what we just read, I think it'd be worth reading. I think it's reading. worth reading. Please do. Psalm 137. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down. Yes, I know. It's, it's... And wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our lyres. For there our captors required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Mm. How shall we sing Yahweh's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem... Above my highest joy. Remember, O Yahweh, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, how they said, Lay it bare, lay it bare, down to the foundations. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed. Blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. That is powerful. Mm. That is so powerful. That kind of took me by surprise there. Mm. <clears throat> I love your heart. <laughs> I love you, sweetheart. It's, again, it's it's hard, you know, with, with our family histories. And we've done some genealogical work and you've seen how often our, our families have moved over the years. You know, I can only trace as my farthest ancestors back to the 15th. Well, no, 16th century, late uh, late 16th, um, maybe some earlier going back to that. If if we trace the English branches or the Welsh branch back, Mm -hmm. but still, um, it it seems that, uh, you know, there's no real origin point that we can nail down. Okay. We got these guys back to Switzerland. We got these guys back to North Wales, but Mm -hmm. where, where before that, they didn't start there. Right. Um, but the people of Israel, Jews, they know they can trace it back. Okay. We know that we came from. This one guy here who started in southern Turkey around the year 2000 BC or a little little before, and you know, family probably came from that region to begin with. We could trace for the last 4,000 years where our families have been. But this one point here, Jerusalem, is at the heart of it all mm-hmm. and has been for 3,000 years. 
But even before that, because God, when he called Abraham, brought him to Mount Moriah, the mountain of the Amorites, which is the Temple Mount, and signaled to the spirit realm, this is where this is going to be reversed. We no longer sacrifice our children. We no longer call on the humans to sacrifice their children. You know, this is God talking to the rest of the divine council. And you who have done this, Psalm 82, you will die like men and fall like any prince. Mm -hmm. But just imagine that. It's a miracle that that the Jewish people can still call themselves a, a people after so many years. How many other people groups that, you know, the Assyrians, there are people who call themselves Assyrian today, mm-hmm. but how do they know? Think, things have been so muddled and mixed mm-hmm. in, in that land for so many centuries that how, how can they trace their ancestry back? The are, Saxons, the Picts, the, the Saxons, Celts. Right, exactly. They were basically faded, you know, left this, the, this, the stage of history. Um, and yet for the Jews, for all that they've been through, scattered and then regathered, it, it is miraculous. Mm-hmm. But so has been the preservation of the Word of God. Amen to that. And I would encourage you, again, I know that we, we talk about this a lot, but trust me, if you go to Israel with us, it will change your life. That's why we hadn't even left yet. And I turned to Derek and I said, we're doing this again next year. Yeah. We have to. Yeah. We have to come back. Because standing in those spots, standing there and looking at Mount Moriah and understanding, you're standing where Abraham stood as he was taking his son to sacrifice him. Mm-hmm. At uh, the gate of Dan mm-hmm. in, the, in, in the north of Israel, which dates back to the time of Abraham. And so, you know, if Abraham came down from the north through mm-hmm. the Bekaa Valley, which was the standard practice because it was a well-watered valley, unlike mm-hmm. the east side of the mountains there where it was mostly desert. Mm -hmm. You'd come down through the area where you could water your flocks and your herds. He would have gone right, you know, this gate right here, this Uh would have welcomed Abraham as he arrived in Canaan. Yes. Wow. Yes. And I I don't know if we'll be staying at the same hotels. We we would like to because Mm -hmm. we loved the hotels. But the David Citadel where we stayed in Jerusalem last year, this past year, our room, we were able to stand on the balcony and we if if we had a you know a little golf club with us, we could have hit the Jaffa Gate. Yeah, yeah, easily. A good well, a good golfer could do it. I, I couldn't have. I don't think I could have. But either. it was. But it, it's that was close. We could was, see the old city oh, wall. Oh, so absolutely, we could see the into th- that whole area, and there were f- fireworks that night. That that yeah. the, that uh, I mean, there was so much celebrating going on. We'll at the be time. there on the anniversary of Israel's independence again. Again, so once again, you'll get to celebrate that with them. And mm-hmm. trust me, the singing in the streets. Yeah. Is incredible, and if indeed they celebrate the Passover, that will be a very interesting time to be there. The um, hotel is close enough. To, we're not, we're not in the greatest shape. I mean, we're we're in better shape than we were a few years ago, but uh, we're still. It's not like we're you know cross country runners or anything. But we were able to walk to the Western Wall without any trouble. Oh, easily. Yeah. So it it, it will be well worth it. Pastor Carl Gallops will be there with us, and. Uh, Messianic Rabbi Zev Parat, who can give us a perspective, who will give us a perspective from somebody who was raised as a uh, rabbi, mm-hmm. Orthodox rabbi, and uh, has accepted Jesus Christ. So he can share some unique perspectives. And our yeah. colleagues from Skywatch TV, Justin Fall and Wes Fall, will be there as well. We're working on a project there we can't tell you about, but uh, you'll be able to uh, witness some of the film work that's taking place as uh, we're, we're traveling from site to site. And if you need information, follow the link at the website, gilberthouse.org. That'll take you to Lipkin Tours' website. And uh, Aaron Lipkin, who is, uh, like us, a, a history nerd, except he gets to look out his back you know, door, basically, and see, okay, Abraham walked over there, and you know, Jacob walked over there. and you know, it, It's so yeah. exciting. It's so exciting. So please, if there's it. any way you can do it, the, the window is closing on, on getting on the buses. Yeah. So take advantage that uh, take advantage of the free mobile app that we have at the website. You found links you will find links there in the left sidebar at gilberthouse.org so you can download these to a smartphone or tablet. That's the easiest way to get the uh, the audio files directly without having to go through and manually download stuff. It's uh, it makes it really simple. And uh Oh, know. and by the way, I want to remind everybody who listens to View from the Bunker VFTB live is still you can listen to it from 7 to 9 p.m. Central every Sunday night. Tonight, your guest is an extraordinary man that we yes. met in Long Island. Yes, David Arthur. Um, he has lived a life that most of us only see described in, in movies. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, he's been through the ringer. 
um, life of prostitution, drugs, um, was, you know, self-identified as transgender for Mm -hmm. a while and is, is now freed from all of that by the love of Jesus Christ. And so he can speak to the agenda of the uh, LGBTQ plus movement. And, and he goes that, into the streets and witnesses. Right. And, and it, it, and again, it's not that we're angry at them or, or hate or fear or anything like that. It's, it's that these are people who desperately need the love of Christ. We all need Jesus. There's no question about that, but they desperately need that healing. And he has been through things that we can, we cannot imagine. So uh, you'll hear a really unique story. David Arthur tonight on uh, View from the Bunker. Uh, VFTB.net is the website. Had some connection issues last week where people trying to listen live kept getting bumped off. Um, the problem was on the Spreaker end, mm-hmm. but I record these offline. So if there's a problem listening live, you can, you'll get it in the archives without the interruptions. So right. uh, you'll, you'll find the archives there at VFTB.net. And there's also a... Uh, free mobile app for review from the bunker. So you can download the mobile app and get all of the archives that way as well. Easy peasy. Yep. Well, we'll close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word and for the miracle that, uh, uh, of the (laughs) preservation of your word and of your people. Lord, we, we look forward to your soon return. Uh, we know we're drawing close, whether it's next year or still a thousand years in the future. We, we have no idea father, but we just pray that all of us, running the race, that your spirit will guide us and lift us up so that we run with all our strength until we reach that finish line. Um, and, and, and Father, just leave as a legacy our witness, our testimony, the way we live our lives and show love to others, the love that you have shown us through your sacrifice for us, Father. Help us to speak the truth without compromise, but to do it in love so that those who have not yet found the gospel of Jesus Christ, will at least see in us some small portion of your unimaginable, unbounded love. We ask that you would bless those missionaries who are preaching the gospel to the ends of the earth, that your spirit would encourage and lift up and strengthen those who are struggling financially, physically, spiritually, emotionally. And Lord, again, we just pray for wisdom, courage, and strength. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We post a new Bible study each Sunday morning. Subscribe to the podcast and explore the archives online at gilberthouse.org. 